the United States Mercury spaceflight program, nothing is more important during a mission than the welfare of the astronaut. Ready, light on. Should any member of the flight team not know his job, the astronaut's life could be endangered. Minus 40. Status check. Pressurization. Go. Lock In any mission, one of the most important phases is the recovery of the astronaut at the termination of the flight. I have lift off. Clock is started. And she feels real nice. And wherever a flight might terminate, from the launch pad to the open sea, recovery teams must be positioned, ready for almost any eventuality. Making up the recovery teams are a specially trained group of personnel from the Department of Defense and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. It is their job to retrieve the astronaut and his spacecraft as rapidly as possible, wherever landing might occur, and deliver them safely to designated areas and personnel. Procedures for doing this job vary according to the physical condition of the astronaut, the state of his spacecraft, and the availability of recovery equipment. It is the purpose of this film to illustrate these procedures. They are detailed in the Mercury Spacecraft Post-Retrieval Procedures Manual. Covered first will be the safety precautions which must be observed to avoid injury. First, the area in front of the spacecraft entrance hatch, located to the right of the observation window, must be considered dangerous. Hatch removal is effected by an explosive charge detonated by a percussion device. Separation, therefore, occurs with considerable force. Normally, retention springs prevent the hatch from traveling more than two feet, but should the springs not be attached, the hatch could travel 25 feet and reach a height of 6 feet. Before the hatch is detonated or rendered harmless by other means, work in front of it must be kept to an absolute minimum. During detonation, the area must be kept clear. Another explosive device, which, if it has not been activated, can cause serious injury, is the reserve parachute pilot gun. Recovery personnel must therefore remain clear of the top of the spacecraft. Also at the top of the spacecraft, the hot gas areas must be avoided because they could discharge and cause harm to personnel. If the whip antenna is not erected, it too must be avoided because it could extend out with considerable force. The flight control system thrust nozzles could cause injury should they discharge or leak hydrogen peroxide. If the hydrogen peroxide does contact any part of the body, the area must be washed immediately with either fresh or salt water. In a word, recovery personnel must be cautious of the area in front of the entrance hatch, the top of the spacecraft, and any substance discharged from the thrust nozzles. Observing these precautions, personnel can recover the astronaut and perform post-retrieval operations without risking injury. After the astronaut lands, helicopters or other appropriate aircraft bring swimmers or pararescue personnel to the site. Standby aircraft carry photographic and auxiliary equipment. After rescue personnel are in the water, the aircraft takes stations where downdraft and noise will interfere as little as possible with recovery operations. Meanwhile, an auxiliary flotation collar has been dropped and it is immediately secured. It consists of a double flotation tube attached to a cable harness. The harness helps support the spacecraft. Starting downwind, one of the swimmers pulls an end of the collar around the spacecraft. The other swimmer feeds the collar from the life raft. The supporting cables are fastened, then tightened with a take-up reel. 
The tubes are inflated from two CO2 cylinders and the ends of the flotation collar are laced together. The collar rights the spacecraft and lifts it six to eight inches higher in the water. A safety strap is fastened over the entrance hatch. An emergency flotation bag is provided swimmers for use if the flotation collar loses buoyancy and the spacecraft is in danger of sinking. A line from the emergency flotation bag is fastened to the recovery loop as a precautionary measure. The astronaut tells the swimmers whether he will leave the spacecraft while it is still in the water or wait until it has been retrieved. If he decides to emerge from the craft while it is in the water, the swimmers prepare to remove the entrance hatch using the explosive charge. Before detonation, protective padding is placed over the side of the flotation collar to prevent damage to the tubes. As an additional means of protection, a one-man life raft is placed between the entrance hatch and the collar. Final preparations for detonation are made according to the manual. After the astronaut is alerted and asked to make certain the hatch retaining springs are in place, one swimmer assumes a safe position beside the flotationer, ready to pull the hatch release cable. The other swimmers clear the area in front of the hatch. One sharp pull normally explodes the hatch, but under some conditions, several pulls may be required. If for some reason this should fail, the astronaut is requested to detonate the hatch. After the hatch has separated, the safety strap and retaining spring pins are removed. The hatch is pulled clear, and the astronaut is assisted from his spacecraft. This is the primary method of egress. The swimmers make certain that his disconnected harness, personal leads, and other fittings are kept clear. Once the astronaut is on the flotation collar, free of the spacecraft, he is assisted into a horse collar and lifted to the helicopter. There, medical personnel assume responsibility for him. If for any reason the entrance hatch cannot be removed by detonation, the swimmers prepare for an alternate method of egress through the top of the spacecraft. All safety precautions must still be observed. First, the swimmers remove the parachute container. This can be done after the astronaut has released the inside connections. In the meantime, the astronaut removes part of his instrument panel to clear his way out. Then the swimmers help him egress. If the astronaut elects to remain in the spacecraft until after retrieval, the flotation collar is attached in the normal manner and other preliminary operations are completed. The recovery vessel approaches the spacecraft from upwind, keeping the astronaut informed of progress. A shepherd's crook is used to attach a line to the loop at the top of the spacecraft. After the hook is inserted, a 30-pound pull releases a quick disconnect fitting separating the stem from the hook. As the craft is raised, care is taken to prevent structural damage. The craft is lowered to the deck and secured, with the hatch facing a chosen working area. The safety strap is checked to make certain it is properly installed around the spacecraft midsection across the entrance hatch. The flotation collar is punctured. The external release handle cover is removed and a lanyard is attached to the handle. The lanyard is rove through a block secured in front of the spacecraft. The astronaut is alerted that detonation is about to occur and he is asked to verify that the hatch retention spring pins are installed. All personnel are warned to clear the danger area in front of the hatch and the safety strap is removed. Again, one sharp pull normally detonates the explosive device but several pulls might be required. Should this fail, the astronaut is requested to explode the device separating the hatch. 
Before egress, certain last-minute procedures should be performed by rescue personnel. The squib switch, located on the left instrument panel, should be checked to be certain it is in the off position. An insert locking pin must be installed in the flight control handle. The emergency O2 handle, located on the right console, is placed in the down or normal position. The recovery light switch on the right instrument panel is placed in the off position. Then the astronaut is assisted out of his craft. If the hatch cannot be separated by detonation, the safety strap is reinstalled and the astronaut egresses by the alternate method through the top of the spacecraft. After egression, Responsibility for the astronaut is assumed by medical personnel. If for some reason the astronaut could not egress through the top and the hatch could not be detonated, a third method of egression is employed. It is used either in the water or on the deck of the recovery vessel. The safety strap is reinstalled and the initiator is struck with a long-handled hammer or other suitable tool. If detonation still doesn't occur, the external release handle cable is cut a few inches from the hatch shingle. The hatch is then removed mechanically with the safety strap in place. The screws and washers are removed from the right shingle, which is then slipped from under the strap. The left shingle is removed in the same way. The hatch bolts are now exposed and two are removed from each corner. If Clico clamps are available, they are installed in place of the corner bolts to help hold the sections of the hatch together. The remaining 62 bolts are then removed. If some of them cannot be unscrewed, they are tightened until they shear. The safety strap is removed and the top edge of the hatch is carefully pulled away against the tension of the retaining springs. The nylon cords attaching the release pins to the springs are cut and the pins are removed. The entrance hatch is removed and handled as a Class C explosive device. Should the spacecraft land far from recovery areas, considerable time may pass before a surface vessel can arrive. Under these conditions, it is necessary to follow prolonged flotation procedures whether or not the astronaut is aboard the craft. First, a small hole is cut in the bottom of a one-man life raft, arrow end. The snap hook end of the spare hatch safety strap is passed through the hole and attached to the V-ring nearest the hook. The V-ring on the end of the strap is passed over the body of a C-clamp. Underwater, the clamp is securely fastened to the edge of the heat shield. The metal straps are cut with shears. If the landing bag is intact, it is cut away with a knife. Interior cables supporting the heat shield are cut and the shield is allowed to dangle on the safety strap below the life raft. The flotation collar pressure is monitored closely and maintained with a hand pump. If chafing occurs, the areas are padded. The harness cables are inspected frequently 
and if excessive wear is noted, the harness is shifted slightly. A backup purse cable is reeved through the flotation collar bridle rings underneath the spacecraft and secured with a shackle. If the spacecraft hatch has been removed, the opening is covered for protection against spray and water. After retrieval, the spacecraft must be secured and data must be recorded. Instructions must be followed carefully making certain that no controls or switches are moved except as described. First, the squib switch is checked again to make sure it is in the off position. Next, the manual reaction control system must be deactivated, clearing the thrust nozzles of residual hydrogen peroxide. During this time, personnel must stay clear of the thrust nozzles. First, the locking pin from the reaction control system handle is removed. The manual control handle is pushed to on. The flight control handle is pushed straight forward, not side to side, and held momentarily. It is then returned to the neutral position and locked with a pin. Finally, the manual control handle is pulled to the off position. Safety pins from the pocket on the right console are installed in the pole rings marked Jet Tower, SEP Capsule, Main, and Reserve. This prevents the pole rings from being actuated accidentally, thus firing an explosive charge. After the astronaut has egressed, his suit inlet and outlet ventilation hoses using the coupling carried in the pocket on the right console. The right instrument panel is now reinstalled if it has been removed. The data on the instrument panel is carefully recorded on the sheets provided in the post-retrieval procedures manual. The next three steps may have been accomplished by the astronaut. If not, the recovery team must perform them. First, the gyro switch on the center panel is placed in the cage position. Next, after a minimum of 10 seconds, the ammeter switch is turned off. It is located on the right panel. Third, the three battery switches on each side of the astronaut's couch are placed in off positions with the pole switches being locked out simply with clothes pins. If the spacecraft has leaked, the water must be siphoned out and measured. The amount is recorded on the data sheets. Even if the astronaut is injured and cannot egress as soon as expected, data is recorded as nearly complete as possible and the spacecraft is secured as far as practical. In the final steps, the thrust nozzles are covered with aluminum foil, then taped. If liquid from the nozzles touches any part of the skin, the area must be washed immediately with fresh or salt water. A cover is installed over the top of the spacecraft and fabric is taped over the hatch opening. The exterior of the spacecraft is hosed down with fresh water. The large pressure bulkhead which is located between the heat shield and the interior of the craft, is washed as thoroughly as possible through the holes in the landing bag. The main umbilical connection, which is located behind an external access door, is washed thoroughly.
To be washed down finally are the five electrical receptacles located behind access doors around the base of the spacecraft. Under some conditions, such as severe damage or saltwater entry, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration may direct that a certain portion of the spacecraft equipment be removed for early transport to a shore facility. The equipment, as well as removal and handling instructions, are listed in the manual. The equipment includes that in the astronaut's ditty bag, the writing desk and glove compartment, plus the 16 millimeter camera. Successful manned spaceflight is the result of long planning and work in a tremendous team effort. And the recovery of the astronaut and his spacecraft is a vital contribution to the total success of the mission. <laughs>